This is Epicenter, episode 375 with guest Trent Elmore. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review in Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Trent Elmore. He is one of the founders of the Yam Project. It took off last summer and it sparked a massive movement and cultural phenomenon in the crypto world. I'm talking, of course, about food tokens. So as Trent explains it, Yam was created as an experiment and it brought together some of the most far out and innovative ideas in DeFi. It borrows from existing concepts. So the fair launch mechanism in Wi-Fi and the rebase mechanism in Ampleforth. Stick them together and you get Yams. Trent shares the details about the early days of the project, how it came together. He talks about the rebase mechanism and how that works. He discusses the YAM treasury and what those funds are being used for today. He talks about the governance protocol and takes us through the hours and days which followed the bug uh, discovery, which of course bricked the protocol and led to the launch of the V2 contract. And finally, uh, shares his learnings from this entire experiment, which are really fascinating. Now, you might be wondering why we chose to do this episode almost six months after the whole food token frenzy started. Well, in true Epicenter fashion, I think having these conversations later uh, affords us the advantage of hindsight, and we're able to learn more about uh, the lessons learned from these experiments, and that was certainly the case here. So if you're holding yams, you may have noticed that the price has gone up these last couple of weeks, and maybe you want to swap them for some ETH or DAI or something else. Well, if you're going to do that, you should go to one inch. It's my go-to DEX aggregator. And I know that when I use one inch, I'm getting the best price across DEXs and MMs. And a couple of weeks ago, they did an airdrop. And so if you've been using one inch these last couple of months, maybe you've got some, uh, some one inch tokens there waiting for you. And I, I discovered I had some and it was a nice little chunk of change. So to swap your yams or discover if you have some one inch tokens waiting for you, go to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. And with that, here's our conversation with Trent Elmore. We're here today with Trent Elmore. He is one of the launchers of Yam Finance, uh, one of the you know hottest projects of the 2020, and like really, you know, I, I'd say like one of the pivotal like moments in the like DeFi evolution over the course of the last couple of months, um, and so. You know, we're excited to have Trent on to help talk with us about like yams and like, you know, especially a lot of the craziness that happened when it first launched, but then also about like, you know, what's the future of the project and where it's going today? Because, it, you know, it is not a dead project as many may think. And so we're excited to see what, what's the plans here. And so, uh, Trent, nice to have you on. Before we get started, can you, uh, about yam, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get involved with? crypto and DeFi. And I know you have another project called Topo Finance. And uh, can you tell us all about it? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. So I guess my uh, journey in crypto and DeFi, well, crypto started, you know, I'm part of the, the 2017 cohort that um, kind of rode that initial first wave um, and then just totally got got hooked on it. Um, my background is originally in uh, art history in school and then advertising after school. Um, so I just really love kind of like, I've always loved the multidisciplinary nature of um, kind of those uh, disciplines, particularly this intersection of like art and culture, visual culture, and then commerce and economics. Um, and so that obviously plays really well into the, to the crypto space. So I really started uh, working in DeFi with my brother Brock um, in the beginning of 2019, really when kind of DeFi first started to emerge as a real thing, when you had Compound and DYDX showing, um, you know, 20, 40% interest rates um, and kind of that initial infrastructure starting to get built out. 
so our first project in the space was called Topo Finance, which originally was a uh, yield bouncer that optimized your your interest rates across um, DYDX, Compound, and Fulcrum. Um, and so essentially, we got that to a beta stage towards the end of 2019. And then as the yields were starting to compress and we didn't exactly foresee the, the yield farming craze that would happen uh, three to four months later, we started to leverage our kind of inter-protocol transaction capabilities and expertise um, to start to go into liquidation and arbitrage strategies. So we started to um, play a more trading, trading prop shop type role in the, the ecosystem. And so we were doing that full time until, uh, you know, we, along with uh, Will, Dan and Clinton, came upon the great yam side quest um, that was originally meant to be just a fun side project that we put together in two weeks. Um, it is now, of course, the main quest and what we're both working on full time. So that's that's a, a brief background on me. As you just said, um, there's uh, five people who actually launched Yam Finance at the time. So it was you and your brother Brock, and then uh, Clinton Bambry, then Eliza and Will Price. How did you guys meet? Um, did you come together to launch this specifically, or is this something that kind of was created, you know, goofing around together? Um, yeah, so Will, Dan, Brock, and I have, you know, been in contact with each other for, you know, the last couple of years at various, um, you know, Skype calls and telegram channels and, you know, conferences and all of, all of that stuff. Um, and Dan was familiar with Clinton and kind of brought him in, but yeah, I mean the, the original assembly of the, the launchers was really just kind of us kicking around ideas and, um, really kind of in the wake of Ample's recent uh, decline in market cap and kind of what, what's known as the death spiral. Um, and so we were just, you know, chatting about those dynamics and how one might prevent that death spiral. And the idea was brought up of instituting a treasury that essentially took some of the positive inflation and, and created a treasury to start to establish a growing price floor. And so then, you know, It seemed like a pretty pretty interesting idea. We started kicking it around more and more, and uh, next thing you know, we just were like, we could actually just go build this and and launch this. And I think we were some of the first in the DeFi space to recognize this fact that oh yeah, you can just go build a protocol and launch it, and you know, it can be. <laughs> that easy, that difficult, um, <laughs> as, as of course is, is actually the, the case. But um, I think it really started a bit of a paradigm shift in that way. And we'll go into the comparison to Ampleforth and the exact mechanism of the rebase and so on later. But be before we actually dive in, you were actually the first of the food coins. So Yam was the first, first of the food coins that kind of launched the food coin craze. How did you guys come up with the name? The name was just a wonderful confluence of factors, I think. Um, so obviously we uh, had this rebasing token similar to Ample, and we wanted to do it in a fair launch mechanism like Wi-Fi. So we just basically took like the Y in Wi-Fi and the AM in Ampleforth, matched it together to make YAM. And then it had all of these really nice kind of benefits associated with that, you know, three name ticker, the emoji, having that that ownable brand asset directly in the, the keyboard. Um, it's it was catchy. Obviously, the yield farming um, was already a, a big meme. So it was just a kind of perfect confluence of, of factors. There's this like a web show I used to watch uh, called Jake and Amir. And in that, Yams was also this like weird meme that they had in that and so i don't know if anyone did any of you watch that show or okay just completely i don't, independent. I don't think so but i'll, I'll check it out because that <laughs> that's pretty funny nice cool and so what was sort of like the role of each of the people on the team like who was sort of the like the coder who was the mechanism designer or was sort of the work sort of split sort of like evenly amongst you guys yeah so um, Brock was the one who who did all of the the engineering and just just did this ten day engineering sprint. 
Clinton was all of the front end development. Dan was kind of the one who assembled and organized us all. And then Will and I were largely involved in kind of the tokenomics, the strategy, um, just general kind of uh, everything that didn't involve like the actual code, uh, including sometimes some data analysis and uh, things of, of that nature. And not all of you are still involved, right? So who is still with them the project? Yeah, so most of the original launchers have kind of uh, gone on to their own new endeavors in, in whatever capacity those may be. Um, Clinton's on Slingshot, which is a new DEX aggregator. Dan has a new fund called Nascent. Um, I think Will is hopping around a bunch of uh, different projects and still providing some, some guidance to Yam here and there. And then it's really just Brock and I who have uh, decided to to keep really grinding on on Yam and uh, steering the steering the ship with a really fantastic group of kind of core contributors who have assembled in the Yam Yam community as well as kind of the general Yam community. So yeah, let's get into then like the design of Yams. What would you say is the proposed like? utility of yam and like you know was the goal what what is it meant to be this like you know the the first thing that obviously pops out at someone when they look at it is this whole rebasing mechanism is that was that meant to be like sort of the flagship feature of this experimental project or was that just something that was you know how should we look at what what was the point of this entire thing Yeah, I, you know, I think it's important to remember that this was an interesting idea and experiment that we wanted to put out into the community. And there's a reason that it was fully decentralized governance from day one. There are so many ways you can take this kind of fundamental mechanism of the rebase used essentially as kind of a programmatic fundraising mechanism for this treasury. Um, You know, there's a world in which Yam actually goes and tries to be legitimate money and, and you know, is similar to Ampleforth in that way. I think the way that it ended up playing out um, was much more like traditional revenue generating style protocol. At least that's that's what the community has morphed it into. So like whatever the concepts were at day one, and I think it's 100% the case that each of the five of us kind of had different conceptions of how YAM might evolve and what its purpose, its purpose is. It's a constantly evolving concept that I think over the past few months of being in kind of the fully operational protocol and having this community uh, working on it and ideating around it, we've now isolated a kind of path that we're wanting to go down, uh, which is essentially this fair launch DAO that seeks to really innovate it at the intersection of decentralized governance and programmable finance and loves this idea of trying new things, building new things um, in a way that kind of ties all of our financial incentives together and the YAM community prospers and grows um, as that, that ecosystem grows. That's really interesting that you're saying, or at least how I understood your answer right now, is that there wasn't really a mission to start with, or at least not a unified one between the five of you guys. So how do you see the mission of, of Ampleforth? Um, because basically Sunny and I did an interview with Evan Kuo um, a couple of months back before Ampleforth kind of embarked on the death spiral. And he said that their intention was never actually to um, create a new form of money or a new stable coin. Their creation had always been from the get-go to create an uncorrelated asset. H how do you feel about that statement? That's interesting. I didn't know that that was kind of their initial vision. I don't think it was. So basically, I think it morphed during, for whatever reason, regulatory or legal or economic, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's the nature of 
startups in a lot of ways, right? Like the, these things that we're trying to do and kind of the thing that's going to find an interesting product market fit and be attractive to people is, is of course, going to, to morph. I think in our case specifically, it, it is largely a product of the fact that this was from concept to launch was 10 days. So it's hard to really rally around and get super aligned on exactly one specific mission, especially in something that's so kind of open-ended as cryptocurrency that rebases and raises a treasury. You know, there's, there's so many ways in which you can, you can take that. One inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. One inch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using one inch last summer and since then it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm and my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. Let's talk about the proposed utility of YAM, the coin. So basically, why would anyone interact with this protocol? I mean, I, I understand that there's that, that there wasn't a mission to start with or not a unified mission to start with, but what would have enticed me to actually interact with your protocol? Yeah, I mean, the, the value of YAM is really in the fact that it um, has the governance rights and control over the, the treasury. And... Associated with that, you know, any increased revenue that the tre treasury can generate, um, new kind of governance tokens that come into the treasury, being able to participate in that governance, um, it really is all fundamentally based around the the value that the the treasury can create. And where does that value come from, Trent? Well, I mean, if you wanted to do some sort of traditional valuation uh you could in some ways do a the fundamental of value of yam comes from the value of the current treasury and its uh future discounted cash flows um i think that's one of the ways in which the community today has really started to look at how we want to develop and the the types of things we want to do is how can we leverage those funds that are currently in the treasury in order to generate additional revenue in the future. Um, so whether that's providing liquidity in products that we build, in products that other people build, whether that's actively managing that treasury, the protocol ends up being, the, and the YAM protocol ends up being quite a complex piece in which you've got this essentially kind of $3 million dollar fund currently that, that needs some sort of management um, in terms of uh, both investments and expenses. You've got the YAM protocol itself, which is this rebasing protocol with a number of tunable parameters um, and some interesting game theory and kind of different incentives going on there. You've got a 5,000, I think maybe 4,000 token holder base that you've got to rally decentralized governance around. Um, and then you're looking at various additional products and protocols that you can build that can leverage that and grow that treasury. Uh, so it's really a quite expansive protocol and community that, that we've created. And it's a lot of work, but a lot of fun. So let's talk about um, a bit about like how the treasury works. And especially in the V1 uh, design, it was very sort of integrated in with how the rebasing mechanism works. And so, you know, when I asked Will about it, the, uh, he, the way he sort of pitched it was that like, you know, the point of this thing is that like we have, the, we're, we're trying to exploiting human psychology 
in like in the sense that like you know there's just the rebasing just causes all this like wild specula speculatory like gambling game and but we're exploiting this by taking a percentage of the speculative value and putting it toward into this treasury that can then be used for public goods funding so could you maybe like first i guess to start off could you walk us through like a little in more detail about how this sort of treasury funding works with the in the context of the rebasing mechanism yeah um totally and i i obviously don't agree with all of uh will's assessments there um but essentially there's the standard rebase mechanism which is that of course uh when the price of the asset is above the peg it will inflate the currency that is meant to decrease the price towards that peg. And on the other side, if it's below the peg, it will uh, deflate to increase that price. And so essentially what the um, YAM rebasing does is it looks at the Uniswap TWAP. And currently we're, um, our main TWAP is actually a two-hop TWAP that goes um, ETH USDC, YAM ETH, ETH USDC to get that $1 um, price target. So we're doing some, some very fun TWAP hopping. But essentially, it looks at the, uh, on a positive rebase, the change in supply that is going to occur according to the rebase calculation. And it takes 90% of that change in supply and distributes it to all of the, the holders, utilizing essentially scaling factor within the token. So all that really changes is the scaling factor number, which automatically adjusts the, the number of VMs you have in your wallet. And then it takes the, in the V1 protocol, takes the other 10% of the supply, mints that supply, and then sells it into the uh, Uniswap pool programmatically to then raise funds for the treasury. Um, so, you know, one of the ways that I've, I've always looked at it is we're using rebasing not so much in this way to to like get this price stability like like ample forth wants to to go for we're specifically using the rebase mechanism to measure demand and then operationalize that demand to raise funds for the treasury i see and so every time there's a increase in demand you take a portion of that increased demand and basically capture that capture that for the treasury yeah exactly um and you know there we've heard a, a you know a variety of pushbacks to this uh to this mechanism you know both outside and inside the the community and it's kind of an ongoing discussion of exactly um you know how this rebase mechanism should uh kind of operate going forward what are some of the most interesting pushbacks a lot of the community basically looks at it as a, a tax on holders. I think part of the negativity around the, the existing function is, you know, what we saw when we went from V2 to V3, which was in V2, Yam has this, uh, you know, $100 million market cap. Uh, and we go into V3 and we have these really high prices, you know, five, $10 that, that then start to get rebased. And if you're in the pool at that time, essentially you end up giving your stable coins up in return for, for yams from the treasury. Um, and so ultimately what we saw was just a, a pretty significant um, collapse in the, the market cap, a death spiral, if you will. So I think, I think there's still a lot of negativity from, from that. The way I really look at the treasury funding rebase is not that similar to, or, or not dissimilar to, essentially, for the whole YAM protocol, um, a bank that issues shares uh, of equity in order to raise capital, it then deploys that capital to generate revenue for the equity holders. And then when it wants, and it you know trades on a multiple of its, of its book value, uh, and if it wants to raise more capital to uh, you know deploy more and generate more revenue, it will then issue shares again. Rather than that process being something that uh, you know a corporate board is deciding and you know whatever whatever that exactly looks like, 
in yam it's the exact same process but the protocol itself is is measuring that demand and, and issuing those uh those tokens but ultimately what what ends up occurring is that everyone not in the liquidity pool receives a small amount of dilution and everybody in the pool receives a greater share of the the network which in general is I don't think anything super novel in terms of how many protocols uh, distribute new tokens into the, the market. The only thing that's really revolutionary here is the fact that it's done, it's done programmatically. And there's then, of course, associated with that less predictability in terms of like that total number and exactly um, it's a little bit harder for, I think, many people to understand exactly what's going on. It's more predictable in the case that you know exactly the factors that are going to lead to that event occurring. Um, but yeah, it's a complex thing. Mm -hmm. So, but this could have been implemented in such a way that once, let's say, uh, some price target of yams is hit, then it mints new yams and uh, sends them to the pool and like sends them to Uniswap and like collects, adds to the treasury. Why was it beneficial to combine this process with the process of like what would be like a stock split, you know? Why not just mint the minimum amount of yams needed in order to add to the treasury each time that some price target was hit? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, that's one of the kind of, rebase replacers that has has been discussed at, at various times in the uh, the protocol you know i think there's a large degree to which we're in many ways just dealing with what was conceptualized as a interesting experiment that was mashing up a number of kind of mechanisms i think there is a degree to which part of it is just the the fun the speculative fun around rebases um, and how that does play into uh, you know the the psychology of the the space I personally wouldn't recommend anyone listening to go launch a, a rebasing protocol because the the hassle of it I think is is far far beyond the uh, the fun of it but you know we also launched at a time in which rebasing was still a very poorly understood mechanism I think I, I remember, Kind of around yam seeing all of these takes on rebasing uh rebasing assets in which people just clearly did not understand what this mechanism was and and how it worked even like people i would consider uh fairly smart in the space um i think now we've seen so many at this point that the people mostly have a handle on it and that it is essentially a, a stock split so, so um trent um can you shed some light on the game theory behind this. So basically, in a rational uh, world, how would I behave? I mean, if you look at the rebasing, your yam becomes worth less, right? So basically, the optimal strategy would be, you know, in on like, a, in a very naive view, the optimal strategy would be to um, sell your yam before the rebase and rebuy them afterwards. But um, then basically everyone could do that. And the, even those people who do that could be front run. So basically, what is, is there an equilibrium? What's the game theoretically optimal way to, be, uh, way to behave in these settings? Yeah, so there are kind of a number of factors and roles to, to consider. And Will Price does on our uh, Yam Finance Medium publication have a great uh, article on you know exactly what his view of the, the game theoretical uh, optimum is. In general, it's just about understanding how the supply changes and how essentially the, the price impact of the rebase sell are actually impacting various, uh, various holders. So you're saying the, the optimal strategy is to sell before the rebase and then buy back right after. Oh, no, no, I'm asking. So I'm, I'm oh, asking basically oh. very naively if on, you know, on a first level interpretation, that would be a good strategy, right? Oh, well, uh, no, um, in general, not because you're not just paying attention to, to price, right? You're also um, actually 
having a percentage ownership of the essentially market cap and network in total, which after a rebase is going to be, you know, for one yam, after a positive rebase that inflates the supply, that one yam before the rebase is going to be a higher percentage of the supply than that one yam after the rebase. Um, so in general, you actually would want to keep your your yams through that rebase. Um, Wait, that's for a negative rebase, right? No, so the positive rebase increases the the supply but, so but then 10 percent one... of the of the yams go into the reserve right so basically then uh, i'd be better off selling before the rebase and then rebuying just after the rebase with that same dollar amount um yes there is uh if you can time that price slippage correctly you actually can get yams at a uh, at a slight discount in that in that scenario yeah correct But then that's public knowledge, so anyone can use that hack. Um, and then basically you have to front run the people who are using that hack to sell before them and buy uh, before, be buy f before them, right? So basically, um, is there, I mean, it's kind of like a recursive problem. So is there, is there an equilibrium? I would imagine that there is, uh, there is some sort of equilibrium that would uh, emerge. What do you see happening in practice? So in general, uh, we do see a lot of people, not so much the, the front running sell, but we do see a fairly quick, as can be expected, a fairly quick buyback up of whatever that um, rebase sell has impacted the price. Um, so originally that in V1, that price impact could be as much as 10%. It's now lowered to 5%. Uh, but we do see that there are many people who are actively monitoring for that specific uh, arbitrage opportunity that does exist, especially in comparison to what the actual uh, kind of inflationary event was. There is a a very specific amount of price impact that should have occurred based on the amount of new supply that's minted uh, that's closer to like one-tenth of whatever the uh, the actual market impact is on the sell. So we see people uh, reading that pretty accurately. Do you have any... So you said earlier that at the time when you launched YAM Finance Protocol, um, people weren't as familiar with um, the rebase mechanism as they are now. Do you have any qualms about having launched at that time? Because obviously, I mean, someone's footing the bill, right? So so, so if, if you look at where the money comes from and who actually ends up profiting from YAM Finance as a protocol, someone's actually paying for that, right? And as with many governance tokens, it's often the retail user who then buys the YAM token on a secondary market. Um, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it goes into some of my general thoughts about these, these community launches and kind of what the best way to approach them is. I mean, I think the, the kind of astronomical market caps that, that Yam achieved were, ended up being really detrimental to, uh, to a lot of people. And I think you know a lot of people end up blaming the the rebase for their for their losses in these cases. Maybe at some sort of technical level that's true, but more generally based on the market, I don't I don't know that it is. In general, the people who really got um, who suffered really heavy losses were those who were LPing throughout that kind of market cap price collapse from you know 100 million to to 10 million. In general, as with any LPing situation. If you're bullish on the on kind of both tokens in your in your pair, this is just kind of a general pool two. If you're bullish on your pool two tokens, then um, in general, it's not necessarily super detrimental for some price price impact to occur and you to accrue more of those those tokens. So, you know, if we're looking at YAM at its current market cap, I think uh, being an LP is a really positive EV 
play because on those positive rebases, you're actually earning, you're actually purchasing a higher percentage of the market cap than um, those who are who are not LPing. So the the long term bullishness is is you know of benefit there. But at the time, you actually incentivized LPing, right? So basically, um, you dropped YAM on people who provided liquidity um, in the YAM Uniswap pool, no? Yes, I mean the protocol. Uh, the protocol did that, as was always its um, extremely explicit functionality. You know, as I was saying earlier, I think one of the things that we've seen, especially lately, from some of these community projects, is that if you build up really large, really diverse community extremely fast, I think almost all of the time it ends up backfiring in some way, shape, or form. I think one of the smartest things that a kind of decentralized, potentially anonymous community-based protocol can do is to kind of begin by building quietly with a really strong product. I think that's something that like Empty Set Dollar did, um, ESD, and I think they've they've achieved some really fantastic things because of that mechanism by which you can, with a small group of you know committed, interested participants, kind of grow a, in a more sustainable way. Right. So speaking of this like community and like growing it very quickly, you know, we talked about the ample for the fourth side of, of YAM, but let's talk about the yearning side of YAMs, which is one of the things that you guys did, which was very interesting, was this staking of other DeFi tokens. And I, I maybe it's not the first one to do something like this. I'd say maybe like Ed, Edgeware was maybe one of the first ones to do this idea of a lock drop. But you guys like took it to the next level wh where like you allowed eight different tokens to be locked essentially in order to earn, to import the community. And so how did you guys come about doing this mechanism? How were these eight tokens chosen? Yeah, it's funny. We were, I mean, when we were building this, we were just like kids in a candy shop being like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. Let's throw this in there. Um, and, you know, obviously when we brought in the fair launch and the decentralized governance, we knew that if we had this decentralized governance, we needed a really strong community to be able to operate and participate in that. And so essentially what we looked at was, okay, Yearn did this, um, you know, stable coin farming. We don't actually want the big stable coin whales to be the ones that are helping govern this weird decentralized protocol. We want the people who have participated in governance before and who know how to operate, you know, DeFi on hard mode. And so that's really what we started to, to look for in terms of tokens that would be included in our, in our farm, these really strong, really strong communities that could get the word out, could participate in governance, could understand the rebasing mechanism. And so we really just thought about how we could build the community that, that we wanted to, to see. I think what ended up happening was that anybody in crypto at all, anybody in DeFi at all, all of a sudden had a way in which to earn and participate in the, the YAM, YAM protocol, which in some ways is, is a really exciting, amazing thing. I don't think that was entirely our intention. And I think that was uh, part of the reason it gained such like just astronomical heights in such a, such a short period of time. And so when you guys did as this like fair launch you know, I guess, yeah, obviously this was meant to be sort of a side project for you guys. Can you help me understand, like, you know, now after you yearn and you guys has been way more fair launches, how does the, like, founding team, you know, fund themselves to do these kind of things? Like, you guys, it wasn't a full-time thing, but, like, when Andre launched Wi-Fi, like, how did he, like, profit off of it and, like, you know, make it worth his time to do it? And is this something you guys thought about as well when, when launching it? 
It's a great question, and it's a you know kind of difficult difficult problem to solve in some cases. We were doing it as a side thing, so again, wasn't um, entirely necessary to uh, fund ourselves through it in the the beginning. The YAM protocol builds up a treasury which can be used to to pay contributors, um, and I think we've seen a lot of kind of protocols after us implement some sort of dev fund that can um, be used to to fund the protocol's development. But, you know, in terms of like pre-launch funding, I think it's, um, you know, quite difficult. You've got now things like fair launch capital and you've got like the, the Molly and Andre or Molly and Alpha fund that they've they've got going for, for some of that. But, I mean, it's it's quite difficult to find the 50 to 75k that you need for a for a major audit of a new protocol that you want to launch uh launch fairly so yeah it's it's kind of a constant problem to to navigate and try and find creative solutions for can i kind of change gears and ask you about the governance of the yam dao so you guys use snapshot which is a product built by um, balance and Aragon. It, it's a fantastic project. A lot of DeFi DAOs use it now. Um, you were one of the first, right? We were indeed. We were the first. You were the first. How how did you um how did you get connected to the snapshot guys? And basically, how did you hear about this? What what, what was your thought process in moving to um, snapshot? And just for the listeners, so basically, snapshot is a tool where you um, signal. By you need some sort of token, the governance token, and then kind of signal at a particular um, point in time, and then basically there's a snapshot taken as to which uh, vote came out higher, yes or no, or proposal one or two or whatever. Yeah, so we really use snapshot as our consensus gaining mechanism prior to an on-chain proposal. You know, we're fully committed to fully decentralized governance, so. Really, nothing in the in the YAM ecosystem can can get done at a protocol level without it going fully on chain. But Snapshot's a great solution in that uh, we can just write some words on a web page and then have people vote on that um, prior to fully developing all of the the necessary code and you know doing all of that. That work without knowing what that what that community consensus is. Um, and so, you know, I think part of it in the early days was just a, a timing and exposure issue in which I think everybody knew Yam had uh, had some governance that, that needed to to take place. We were very much in the, the spotlight and we were actively looking for something that would allow us to get direct token holder consensus. And so the balancer guys reached out and then uh, got connected with with Snapshot. And we were uh, very happy to be kind of the testing ground for uh, for their tool, which now is like used by, you know, it seems like hundreds of uh, various DAOs. So yeah, really, really fun to kind of play, play a part in their story as well. So what are your takeaways from uh, community governance with um, off-chain voting or off-chain governance in a way? Again, it's a it's an extremely useful tool for us as a step in our governance process. You know, our governance process really starts in Discord with uh, just chatting about various ideas, proposals. It then goes to the YAM forum where a more fleshed out proposal is submitted and people can kind of discuss, poke holes in it. We have a kind of uh, signaling vote on the forum and then it goes to snapshot governance at which point um, it's not just like if you click the button on the forum page, it's actually how many tokens do you have, what is your actual stake and governance power. And then we can use that to go on chain and kind of do a variety of batching of proposals on chain for um, kind of to to help lighten the the weight of that governance overhead and process. But it's a it's a super important tool in the the arsenal of of VM governance for sure. How was the like pr you know one of the parts of the you know YAM origin story and myth is that like you know it 
it was went from idea to deployment in like 10 days. And so like, what was that process like, especially when it comes to like writing the code and stuff? You know, normally projects take, obviously something like Cosmos is like a completely different thing, but like, you know, in our head, it's like, oh, just going to take like eight months and ended up taking us like 24 months. How did you guys manage to like actually execute and deploy so quickly? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I mean, Brock is really a very fantastic engineer with a great kind of already built in understanding of deep knowledge of compounds protocol in general. So there was some synergies in terms of adding that governance module, the staking contracts from SNX and Wi-Fi are pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, then a lot of it came down to the the rebasing and treasury components. Basically, he just code sprinted for for ten days. There were a number of there was extensive testing, but um, you know I think Brux recently, not recently, recently as in four months ago after this issue, kind of revamped his entire testing suite and has built a lot of kind of custom stuff for that. And by the issue you refer to, you're referring to the big bug, right? The big bug. That is that is correct. Can you walk us through the big bug? Uh, I mean, that was the one of the one of my darker darker moments. I think for a lot of us. Um, so basically, uh, shortly before the first rebase, basically, kind of uh, you know an hour or so before, we actually forked mainnet and ran the the rebase essentially in in production as it was as it was operating um and then uh began to notice the issues so we then started to obviously communicate communicated that to the community and um you know started to look at uh various solutions and so we were um at that point in conversation with a number of uh different people trying to think if there was going to be a solution to this issue and essentially it seemed like there was going to be time to get a uh, governance vote in what was unrealized at the time was that the execution portion of compounds governance module right at the the time of the last step in the the execution governance process actually does one more check as to whether quorum has been hit and so you know it's one of the lessons of <laughs> this whole thing uh, is just how complex these systems are and the interactions between them. I think especially in a situation like this, in which once this bug is introduced, it's it's no longer the system that Brock designed. And so it becomes a totally different thing with uh, kind of new emergent emergent properties. And so it was, yeah, it was a total... Total nightmare. Thought we could could save Yam. I don't think I've ever, or will ever, see global coordination effort like that again in my lifetime. In uh, you know, under twelve hours, it was insane, insane to see. And then it uh, it got quite dark again after that when uh, it it was discovered that we could not actually fix the uh, the bug and the protocol was bricked. Even though it ended up not working, I thought like the recovery effort was like super cool to watch because like, you know, we were all like watching that over that, that, that uh, recovery bar. And then like at some point it like overflowed the web page itself. And I think that was like something really cool to watch. What are like some of the other highlights of the process? Like what do you think did go really well in the recovery process and allowed you guys to do this sort of like global coordination? I think it was just a combination of how exciting it all was. And I mean, I think we've seen this kind of all throughout DeFi summer, how drama filled and exciting this, this space can be. And people love to participate in that and feel a part of it. I mean, it's, it's, people have called it like a massive MMO. It's like, yeah, we're, we're all playing a a co-op video game. That's co-op PVP depends on the, the day and the, the person, I suppose. So I, you know, I think that's a huge a huge part of it was that it was a moment in which we can all kind of play and do this this thing together and it was truly very special to to see you know i think 
after that, it really was just a kind of somewhat grueling process of, okay, how are we going to make this right with people? How are we going to allow this experiment to take form if people want it to take form? So obviously, like when when it happened, we essentially said, okay, if the community funds an audit, we will get the protocol audited and and redeploy. And, you know, within two hours that that audit had been funded. And then, you know, I think for for Brock and I especially, it felt like it was our responsibility to essentially clean up the mess. Um, and so we felt that that was really important for the the community and the people that had been involved and had done work to make this thing happen. It felt like it was our turn to uh, to put in the, the work to, to make it happen. And so that's what we did. We went through this uh, V2 governance process of, um, you know, this migration and this kind of voting period on what V3 was going to look like and then the final V3 migration. Um, and we've really just been focusing on building a community of contributors that are aligned with the vision that that exists and that has emerged um, and who really just want to build cool things in DeFi um, and kind of explore what these these bounds are. And so it's it's been really fascinating and fun to see kind of that emergent community come about. So if you were in your own shoes um, six months ago, would you do this again? And if you would do it again, would you still put your name to it? Well, I would certainly not do it exactly the way we we did it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think we kind of we obviously massively, massively underestimated the uh, amount of attention and excitement that this thing was was going to generate. Um, maybe that was a little bit naive of us at the time, but. Uh, it certainly looks naive now based on how some of these things operate. But at the time, we had no idea that this is how it was, uh, that it was going to go. So would certainly get an audit. Um, I think the anonymous aspect is, is quite interesting. I think one of the reasons that it did blow up in the way that it did was um, because Brock, me, Will, and Dan, and Clinton kind of all like have been in the space for a long time. And there was some kind of reputational legitimacy that we gave the, the project, despite the fact that it was this 10 day, 10 day thing. Uh, going back again to this idea of, you know, a little bit more slower, sustainable growth in a community launch project. I think if we had done it under pseudonyms that that would have been more the case and things would have gone more aligned with our our expectations. Um, but, you know, we didn't want, obviously some people knew what we were doing and that we were working on something and people were going to know who we were. We didn't want it to be a weird thing where it's like, oh, the insiders are building something and like the other insiders know about this thing. And like, we really wanted it to be a true fair launch decentralized uh protocol and you know in many ways that is indeed what we got do you think um sushi sushi swap would have gone even faster if the identity of chef nomi had been known that's a good question i think uh probably but it also it also depends i think ours would have gone slower but sushi swap coming right after us it was so clear what was going to to happen maybe would have been a little bit a little bit faster if the uh if it wasn't an anon founder but i think the wave had kind of started at that point what do you think about like you know your role in this like yams's role in the creation of this like whole food coin movement and do you think this was a what do you think about its like impact on like the course of defi yeah, it's super weird. I've obviously have some mixed feelings about it, but there have been a lot of great things that have come out of it. I mean, I think I think Sushi Swap is is probably the the best example in what we're seeing with kind of the the why the wire and alliance has has been a really cool emergence that's kind of come about from all of this. But my general 
thought is that in a space like this, all of this does seem inevitable at some point. There's nothing stopping someone from deploying code and uh, forking projects. And for so long, there was no real monetary incentive to, to actually do that. We kind of hit this, hit the start of this bull market, and all of a sudden there's monetary incentive, oftentimes really large monetary incentive to fork a protocol and, and start doing this. It's like, did Yam kick it off? Or like, was it pretty obvious that like this type of thing was possible and all of a sudden the incentives align to actually motivate people to, to do it? It feels like we may have been on the front end of the, the zeitgeist in that moment, but it was all going to play out something like this anyways. Do you think that the food coin meme had you guys created such a good meme? In, okay, so what I'm thinking of, like, you know, if you ever seen those like YouTube videos where people like pull like these like really like mean pranks and stuff and they're like, oh, no, it's just a joke, bro. It's just a joke. Like, do you think it's like <laughs> this whole food coin meme and like, oh, no, it's just an experiment, bro. Like, you know, it's just a food coin. But that really like, you know, maybe there's something more malicious going not in the case of yams but like in you know yams on if you look at the github repo it has 251 forks one of which is mine do you think that was like do you think your meme got perverted into something that you didn't like in a lot of cases yeah absolutely it's also you know i've never seen front end interface forked like that it was really quite something to see of it just like become a standard. I've never seen a front end interface become an absolute standard. So, you know, definitely hats off to Clinton for, for that work. It was really, really cool to see. Yeah. I mean, it, it of course got, got perverted and a lot of it is similar to kind of my early argument that as soon as these incentives align to motivate this behavior, like the scammers come out of the the woodwork. And I don't like having been a part of providing them an interface for doing that and providing them a, a highly marketable meme for, for doing that. But it's also the nature of the space to latch on to memes and riff on them. Definitely didn't quite predict how much this one was going to take off. I think one of my favorite moments in all of this was the the webpage that came up that was uh, you know, every single food emoji dot finance um <laughs> available for for purchase. And there's the there's the little thing like we'll take like ETH BTC and then Yam and then like they crossed out Yam. I just thought <laughs> that was really I thought that was really funny. And so let's talk about like what's the looking forward for Yams uh now. You know, one of, I think the main shifts I see is that like up until, or at least, you know, previously the most of the treasury accumulation was coming from, intended to be coming from the speculative value of, uh, of yams. Uh, and like, you know, as the demand increases, that adds more to the treasury. But now there's, now there's like a large push in the community towards, creating more cash flow, like other sources of cash flow generation for the treasury. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about like, what are some of the projects that are happening in this uh, regard? Yeah. And so this was kind of always how I, again, imagined the the treasury would work and how the, the protocol would, would work. If we're just amassing this treasury and not doing anything with it um it's like is that's that's not exactly a, a great deal for uh for investors so it's like what can we do with that um those treasury funds that that we accrue that actually uh return value for um yam holders and so over the past you know couple of months we've really been working on a variety of ways in which we can we can take this so some of it has just been pure investment. So we've built out some custom OTC contracts that we've executed large purchases of uh, ETH and DPI. And so that's a, a cool contract that uses TWAP bounds to ensure fair pricing um, and allows a DAO to actually make an OTC trade, which is uh, quite interesting. And then we took that ETH and DPI and we're farming index with it. Um, so we're generating some, some index revenue. We've also got we're incentivizing YAM ETH 
liquidity on sushi swap and so when people deposit into the yam incentivizer we actually then take that slp and put it into the sushi bar and actually earn sushi for the treasury and so there are a number of kind of treasury management type things we've been working on our kind of upcoming one is the yam dao set in which we're working with set to use their v2 contracts to have a more active treasury management system that still retains full trustlessness so we're essentially hiring a set manager who is going to be Krugman uh on on Twitter who's actually currently the second second largest AUM on set protocol so essentially targeting some correlation numbers and just general allocations that then can be rebalanced and, and managed in a more active way that also will have a management fee that other DAOs or investors can actually participate in the management strategy that that we're um, that we're following. So we've got that kind of treasury side of things. When it comes to the treasury side of things, how do you make sure that like the governance of this is like nimble enough to make decisions in timely manners? And like, also, how do you make sure like, you know, because all of these decisions now are public and have to be voted on? How do you make sure they aren't like front run, basically? Yeah, I mean, that's a how do we make sure we're not front run? It's it's I don't know, that there's a whole lot we can do there. The set collaboration is really our attempt to combat the degree to which every single movement of treasury funds requires a one to two day forum discussion, two day snapshot, two and a half day governance process. So it's like there's a minimum five days to do anything with the treasury. Once we get it into the V2 set, we're going to be able to uh, make some of those changes on a much faster time frame. We've orchestrated the treasury manager contract to have certain guardrails. So like the set manager can't just like add a new token or add a new farm kind of willy-nilly to make sure that you know those those uh, treasury assets are still really safe and secure and we don't have to trust that that krugman has uh has yam's best interests in mind even though he does trying to really balance that being nimble and having that that active management side of things but um also, you know, we've we've got to be uh, really careful in how we're we're doing these things. There's a lot of people's money at stake, and uh, decentralized governance moves moves slow. Um, so we're we're thinking really actively about how we can always be be more nimble, but also um, still retain the trustlessness, decentralization, and, and security. Um, and, and you're going to talk about a little bit about the uh, before I cut you off. You were going to mention some of the other stuff that's being built. Yeah, a couple other um, of kind of our major product pushes are, I think by the time this ep- episode comes out, we'll um, have announced our UMA collaboration on a product suite we're calling uh, Degenerative Finance, um, so Degen Derivatives. So essentially, these are going to be a variety of derivatives built on top of UMA's infrastructure that will allow DeFi users to essentially speculate on a variety of kind of on-chain DeFi metrics. So the contract we're taking over for UMA is the UGAS contract, which is essentially a one-month gas future. We're looking at uh, some impermanent loss hedging, some total value locked derivatives, um, volatility derivatives. So the building out this general product suite on top of UMA contracts, which which we're really excited about that collaboration. And they're obviously uh, an excellent team to, to work with. So building on top of other protocols is something we're definitely interested in doing. Um, but we're also building uh, currently a, a, you know, DeFi Lego insurance product called Umbrella uh, that essentially takes a Uniswap slash balancer approach to the creation of uh, these insurance pools that an underwriter can come in and underwrite what we call a meta pool that consists of various contracts that it covers. And then protection seekers can come in and get protection on a single contractor protocol specified by, by the meta pool. And so I think one of the really cool things about that, besides its um, kind of trustlessness and uh, ability to build these different configurations and have different uh, kind of pricing models and things like that. Um, I think one of the big differentiators is the degree to which you can get coverage on specific 
contracts. So you can imagine, for instance, uh, a urine meta pool that has each vault included in it. And rather than having to purchase protection on just urine in general, I can say, okay, I have my funds in the YUSD vault. That's the one that I actually want protection on. So I don't need to necessarily be paying for all of these uh, all of these other vaults that are that are included. Uh, and there are a no- number of other kind of interesting things, but I th- I think that's one that's um, that's going to be quite interesting and uh, different from the existing protection protocols that we've seen pop up in the last in the last couple months. And so who's doing like the building and designing of all these things. So like, is it still mostly you and Trent or are there other community members? You know, I think one of the most fascinating things about Urine is how they successfully managed to like grow the development team. How has that been going on within the YAM community? Yeah, I, you know, we've assembled a really cool group of contributors um, kind of across a, a number of disciplines. So, you know, we have... Brock and um, Nate Welch, who is a former Total engineer, uh, are really kind of leading our smart contract work and doing a lot of that development. Uh, We've got a full stack developer called Zero X that's handling a lot of our front end. We have a couple brand design marketing folks um, that are looking at both our marketing execution, our interface design and branding, as well as like kind of these mission statement and brand pillars um, that that we've been rallying the the community around, as well as just a number of people who are focused on you know operations, strategy, ideation, uh, kind of general product and project management. So we've assembled a great a great crew, and we're kind of currently in the process of onboarding some of them to be full-time contributors that receive uh, monthly payments. And in terms of like the governance process with that, we've deployed actually a new, a new governor. So we have a multi-governor model and this, the compensation governor essentially has a low, lower quorum requirement. So it can be kind of managed by less people, but it's got a much longer time delay such that the um, kind of main Yam governance can always uh, go and cancel any proposal that that is that they don't agree with. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of this kind of organizational building, which has been an interesting experience outside of the framework of you know typical company structures. So you know we're a little less probably laissez-faire than Yearn is in terms of their like uh, you know just come literally here's the GitHub do whatever you want. We probably have a little bit more more structure, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, this is really exciting. I mean, like, you know, I, th- that whole brand exercise thing you mentioned, I, I thought it was, I, you know, I read through it. I, I really liked that. I felt that it was like such a honest evaluation of the entire, like, you know, current status of the public percept of the brand and like, and where we want to go. And, I feel, I feel like more projects need, like, you know, I'd love to, like, I, I actually shared it with a bunch of people at Cosmos and be like, hey, we should, like, do this brand exercise for Cosmos as well, because I just thought it was very well explained and done. Yeah, and that was, like, step one. That's contributor named, named Jim. He goes by designer. He is actually, you know, like a brand brand strategist guy, and so he came in and said, okay, let's start with these brand perceptions. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And then kind of took it to these brand pillars of, okay, this is, I think, what YAM stands for based on its its history and its current community. And then kind of transform that finally into a cohesive mission statement that, um, you know, we got like kind of tagline, short form, long form of, you know, this is what the YAM community stands for, believes in, and is trying to to do in the world. Um, and so we're currently ratifying that mission statement uh, on Snapshot right now. So it's it's been really cool to see some of some of that work happening. He's he's really excellent. Well uh, thank you Trent for coming on and like you know telling us about the story of YAM from past, present and future and as well as the you know legacy of YAMs. And so yeah thank you. And is there any uh, w- w- anything else you want to share or anything where people can learn more about any of the new projects that are being built and how they can help out? 
Yeah, I mean, one of our best places to to go learn about what we have going on is our our Discord. You can find the link in our Twitter bio at Yam Finance. And you know, if you're interested in building in DeFi on some of the things we're working on, on some new things, like we are very interested in you know collaborating, seeing what we can can do and uh, work on together. And yeah, it's, it's an amazing community to be be involved in. And thank you both for uh, having me on here. It's been a lovely time chatting with you. Um, yeah, very much appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.